Hey, and welcome to the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife. On this week's episode, we're answering a listener question. How would you get started investing if you had $1,000? And we're going to try out a brand new segment to yet to be named where Christoph and I are going to pitch an interesting off-the-radar stock to each other, and we're going to ask you guys to tell us which one of them was the most interesting. And maybe the most interesting might become a feature on a future episode. I think this is beyond the blue chips. Maybe it's a vulture hunt. Who knows? Anyway, two interesting off-the-radar stocks coming up in the back half of this episode. Christoph, you are looking excited. Why is that? I'm really excited because, my dear Badger... We have gained three animals into our jungle menagerie. Paul Bruce Blohoviak, apologies if I butchered that, and Paolo Manlapaz have said, essentially, we value what you guys are doing and we want you to stop wasting time doing all the background editing and all that stuff. And we want you to focus on getting the show to be as good as it can. And we're going to throw you some coin to help support you. And boy, let me tell you, Badger, it feels really, really good to see folks supporting us in this way. They believe in us. That They do, surprisingly. And I was holding you back for at least six months saying, do not turn on the Patreon. We can't ask for money. We're not, we haven't got enough of a presence yet. And then you twisted my arm and lo and behold, we already have Patreons. I am surprised. We have three more Patreons than I expected. <laughs> yeah, and I think the uh, I think the the test case here is that unlike say the YouTube model, which is you know people try to just make it as big as possible as quickly as possible to monetize, I think the Patreon model is different because it says like here are people that don't necessarily want or need anything back, and they don't want to be seen anonymous. They're stepping out and saying like we're part of your tribe, and we want you guys to be as good as you can and you know, we're stepping up to the plate. So I think to me, it's like a little bit of that building trust and your small intimate community that starts small and then who knows where it gets to. But uh, fellas, thank you so much for your vote of confidence. We're definitely motivated to keep going and, and getting better and better. Absolutely. And if you would like to become a Patreon of the Wall Street Wildlife Podcast, you can find Christoph and I at patreon.com slash Wall Street Wildlife, all one word, just as you'd expect it to be spelled. Indeed. So take a look at all the animals available that you might find in the jungle and see if one of them matches the reflection in the mirror. And Christoph, we are going to have to fast track creating some damn merchandise. Now someone's paying for it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> one last thing. There are two tiers I created just to, just to see uh, how many people will opt for team monkey versus team badger as a little you know in-house competition so if all of a sudden we have a hundred bad badgers and zero monkeys I, <laughs> that would not that would not look very good for me so <laughs> well um, there could be well be a hundred monkeys out there but they're all going to blow themselves up with their wild options trading mm -hmm. when the market melts down and then they'll have to withdraw as our patreons whereas any badger patreons are just going to uh <laughs> cruise into the sunset making solid compounding returns and wow. hopefully stay as part of team badger i'm never gonna hear the end of that am i <clears throat> <laughs> well the end of the king of the jungle is coming up at the end of october this probably leads us into our next topic how would a beginner invest a thousand bucks which is an excellent question that came on x from suzanne who goes by the handle of wonder woman suzanne said hey luke i'm a beginner investor and i'm listening to your podcast can you give me your opinion on buying a thousand dollars worth of shares for a beginner? Interesting question. I thought we could pick this up in conversation because this is our shtick. This is the stuff we love to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Maybe as a refresher for some new listeners, our King of the Jungle portfolio challenge started almost a year ago, specifically as a way to model the way we're handling this question. And the first thing I like to say, I guess, uh, improv style is the thousand dollars ought to represent an amount of money that you literally do not need, but you're wondering, what should I do with it? Should I put it in the bank account? Should I buy a bond or should I invest in stocks? And obviously, if you're listening to us, you've made the wise decision to invest in stocks because that's the 
highest, most profitable asset class. But point being that the thousand dollars is not an overwhelming amount. It's manageable. If you need to take off a zero to make it feel manageable, then do that. Then the hundred dollars is the same. It ought to feel the same, right? Yeah, and, and I think in these modern days of fractional trading, you can get started with literally a couple of bucks. Like if you end up buying like a thousandth of a percent of a Mercado Libre share and you've got like a $5 holding, well, actually there are platforms that exist that enable you to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Second point I would say, referring back to King of the Jungle, is that the thousand dollars, the way we see it, ought not to be the end all and be all. I think it's even more important to then say each month, I'm going to add X. And the way we did it is we were adding $100 at the start of each month. So that's what 10% of the original. But why is that so important? It's not that the dollar amounts themselves are the end all and be all, because like you preach all the time, it's the magic of compounding that does its work over many, many, many years. So whether you start with 100 or 1000, it doesn't matter. But whether you add $100 every month, that will really make the difference. So I would kind of rephrase the question almost like $1,000 to start on this day, knowing that there's going to be incremental amounts put in each following month, say. And you gotta, you got to learn your lessons and kind of take your knocks and your bruises. And podcasts like ours, and there's tons out there also, will help you identify interesting stock ideas, help you figure out your investing process but you're still going to slip up here and there. And if you're, if it's in the early years, if it's an amount of money that's not going to wipe you out, if the market maybe turns on you nastily and bites you, or if uh, you make a mistake, quite frankly, and you can recover from that, it's great to learn the lessons, get started young, and then when the money becomes significant much later in life, like you've learned quite a lot along the journey. Like Suzanne, the most important thing and to all our listeners out there, if you're listening to us and you haven't started investing yet, the most important thing is just get started. And like Christoph says, it doesn't take a lot of money to get started. Even in low tech UK, there are fractional trading platforms. I'm not endorsing them in any way, but the one I happen to be using for my King of the Jungle portfolio is Trading212. I think if you're in the US, you've got platforms like Robinhood, you're using SoFi. There are a bunch of platforms out there that let you trade for no fee and they let you buy like a tiny fraction of a stock. So you don't need, like if you want to buy one share of Mercado Libre, I use that as my example, because like one share costs you over $1,000. That would be probably more than the whole of Suzanne's portfolio if she was starting out. So she'd have to wait a little while. She could never be diversified. We'll talk about that in a second. But fractional trading platforms take a lot of that friction out. They make it really easy to get started with relatively small amounts of money. Right. I would like to go back to the um, starting amount as, it's not that it's random, but it's just step one of, an, of a, in theory, multiple many steps. And the reason I, I want to reiterate that from a different point of view is that you should expect, I think, for anything to happen. And right now, the stock market is nearing all-time highs. So I would not, as a beginner think, oh, let me wait for the stock market to crash because you might be waiting for a very long time. Instead, you take that initial, say, $1,000, and then you say to yourself, because I'm going to be adding $100 uh, next month, then if the stock market does fall, I'll be able to buy the companies I liked even more cheaply. So it's a kind of built-in system that if you really have the long-term approach, you won't be afraid of the market falling. There's a really nice tweet I saw a few days ago. I'm trying to find it as I speak. I think I'm going to probably struggle to find it live. But essentially, it had a chart that showed market returns if you invested on, I think, like a, every, a, a random day or every day versus market returns if you only invested on days that were an all-time high and in the long run, like 20 years plus, investing on all-time highs yields more money 
like a better return than investing on like a random day that could be any point in the cycle might be the lowest part middle part and it's so counterintuitive but in the long run the most important thing is get started get your investment rolling start to learn your lessons don't try and wait for a downturn because it might never come right and i would also say 20 years i think is the number i think of as kind of a long time because you know we don't live forever you and i have already been doing this for over 20 years and even now i'm i'm 45 i kind of think wow because i keep myself in pretty good shape fingers crossed i think i'm still going to be you know a uh, uh, a feisty 65 year old which means i could kind of start today with the same exact mentality knowing that i'll have 20 years for the market to work for me so it shouldn't matter that it's at all time highs right now just get started so that's the main point right that we're reiterating having yeah. said that any specific strategies that you're thinking of well, let's pick up on that question of diversification because i think that's quite important i think implicit in suzanne's question is she wants to buy stocks like stock shares in individual publicly listed companies but that's not the only way to get started as an investor and actually when you're starting out you might literally just want to buy passive index trackers by an index tracker like SPX or VU where you're tracking the S&P 500 or maybe the FTSE or the Nasdaq and start with the majority of your money in those trackers i th- i would accentuate the passive i think it's quite important that you don't have that kind of money in actively managed funds because in general they don't outperform the market but by definition passive index trackers are the market and you could start with maybe 70 80% of your money in an index and you could just have a little fun money on the side that you put into individual stocks so putting that caveat aside let's dive into Suzanne's question though which is she's got 1000 bucks and she wants to invest that in stocks okay let me backtrack and pick up something you said um some people do swear by passive in- investing and then they just buy the market tracker for example ticker SPY that would track the the top 500 stocks that that mimic the market i would alter that to say that, that as individual investors picking individual companies is the harder gig and it's not for everyone but i like this idea if i'm starting from scratch i like the idea of buying one share of something like SPY which will as long as i don't sell it ever will show me how much money i would have gained 10 years from now just by looking at that one ticker in my portfolio so it's kind of almost like a hack that says you're buying it not to buy passive funds but you're buying it as a measuring stick obviously you could do that via portfolio tool right but but it's a little different when it's real money is all i'm saying so as a proposition i like what you're saying about dividing your money into say say percentages but one of them i'm saying make it the spy index tracker as one of your positions here's passive investing as a as a, as though it were an individual company i think we're going to sidetrack the conversation because i want to rip that apart completely <laughs> i think oh. we're going to sidetrack we're going to sidetrack what we want to talk about <laughs> let's hear it let's hear it well so one share of it, of spy will cost you $569 right now so if we're talking fractional trading there's nothing meaningful about one share right and you wouldn't buy one share of a $500 stock in a $1000 portfolio just right, for fun right 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 i i see okay sorry yeah, i meant one uh c- call it uh unit before getting into percentages i would say a, i'm still ripping this about what's a unit right and like any portfolio management tool for example one i'm going to talk about in the next couple of weeks i've just started using and quite impressed with that'll show you like your portfolio return against a whole bunch of different indexes and it's more complex if you want to compare i said this is a damn rabbit hole i might i might cut this and put it in the appendix okay so um it's it's more complex cuz say what if Suz- what if suzanne buys like one share of google today and then she buys a share of amazon next week and then she buys a share of mercado libre next month what is she benchmarking against does she buy like one mystical unit each time she buys another thing Wait a second. Oh, I think all I was saying as an idea for a beginner who has zero in their portfolio is 
if you buy it's a unit or a percentage or a dollar amount, let's say $1,000. So let's say $10 worth of SPY. Okay. Right. Maybe even like that's a 1% holding. Sure. And then doesn't touch that. So it's just sort of sitting there. It's its own built-in tracker that anytime I open that portfolio, I see 10 years from now, oh, that that is up however many percentage points, but it's but you see it relative to all the other stuff you have so you never need i don't i don't do i understand your pushback i don't think i understand your pushback against that you're saying it's making it more complicated yeah i am you're not getting a true if you wanted to mark your portfolio against an index you wouldn't pick an arbitrary start date and say okay i had all my money invested on this one day because you trip your money in right and we're putting right, right, right. yeah 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 if you want right. to benchmark against an index right you have to look at all of your inflows and outflows and benchmark them individually and then you get like a grand total i think so right i'm i'm using it more like just this basic orientation that if i'm starting if i'm literally starting on september 23rd and it's 10 years from now i could see like in 10 years from the day i started the market went up this much and it's like a nominal amount. It's not going to make a big difference in terms of your investing, but you could always see that it, it it's like a, you'll see, it, it's almost like since I started investing, how much has the market gone up or down? That's it. You know, this, this argument has taken us so far off the track. Maybe yeah. we should cut this out and turn it into a special tiny mini argument just for Patreon members. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, so ignore or not ignore. So you, you're at liberty to ignore my suggestion to buy one share of an index tracker, if you think Badger's line of reasoning that gets makes things too complicated is worthy. I'm not. I'm not bound to it. I think it's just an interesting idea. It's what I would do if I were starting today. That's I'm a fan of that random ass shit you do in your portfolio of one share and this and that. Just stick it. Stick it on a watch list like a normal person. <laughs> Okay, so spy trackers aside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get back onto Suzanne's question. Right, so, uh, but I think we both agree whether or not you have like units of other stuff. I think we both agree that you shouldn't just have like your entire portfolio in one stock. You should have a range of stocks. Ideally, at least, let's say if you're really starting out 10, but ideally 12 to 15 different companies that are not all like the same company. You know, if you buy, I don't know, NVIDIA and AMD and Supermicro and a few other like semiconductor stocks, they're all in the very same industry. And if that industry nosedives, they're all going to kind of stay pretty highly correlated. But if you own like an entertainment company and a retail company and a maybe like something in consumer goods, like something you buy in the supermarket and maybe like a car company, you've got like a bunch of uncorrelated assets, broadly uncorrelated, um, you've diversified i.e. if one thing goes down, they don't all necessarily go down and wipe you up. Obviously, they will all go down and up with the whole market, but that's why you want to be invested for at least five years and ideally 20 years plus a lifetime. Okay, I'm, I'm going to object a little bit in saying I think this is already like getting into not necessarily intermediate waters, and everything you said is true. But I think there's a more fundamental first step. I agree that with the thousand dollars to make it simple for yourself, because it should not be a lot of money to you, you you go and divide that thousand into nice even ten percent chunks. Yeah. Later on, as money keeps flowing in, you could either decrease it a little bit or increase it to say fifteen or twenty companies. We'll talk about those limits later. But start with ten. 10% in each. But before you start thinking about, say, the, the, the nuances of like industries, I would say, ask yourself which companies in your life you genuinely know about or use. This is the Peter Lynchian model yeah. that you care about or are enthusiastic about. So you basically, it's like proof of concept because you as the consumer like them. So for example, Apple, here's the difference. Like you, I might not invest in NVIDIA because I don't, you know, the chip, I don't see the chips. I don't understand the chips, right? It's versus say Apple or Chipotle, right? I like their burritos or I like their computers. 
that's a different kind of entry point. Yep. But don't stop there. Yeah. The next step I would really insist on is if you're going to buy a share, the very least you should do is go to their website. For example, let's use Apple. I type in Apple space IR for investing relations. And then I would look for their latest, uh, usually the, the, the nicest general overviews, like their annual presentation, which might have happened, say, nine months ago or six months ago. But at the very least, you want to see what the company is saying about itself, how it's presenting itself. And you'll find out all kinds of stuff that you probably didn't know even about some product that you like. Once you've done that and you say, yep, I like this company. And you ask yourself, do I believe in its future? Like the next kind of fundamental basic point, do I think it's going to remain a good company? Then take 10% of your money and invest in that. As a starting point, this is not meant to be rocket science. This is meant to get you to the just start. Yeah, I like what you said. You're absolutely right. This is why you're an educator and I'm like some guy who just sits in front of a keyboard. Um, <laughs> you, made it, you made it simpler. It, it is good. And you, it might seem kind of a bit bewildering and scary when you go and look at an investor relations page on the website. But most companies, not all, but most companies have like a really pretty friendly, easy to access like slide deck, PowerPoint deck or something, PDF deck. And it's just like 30 or 40 slides and you can skim through it in 10 minutes. And what you're trying to do when you do that is probably just, you know, if you're starting out, probably just be able to answer the question, what does the company do, right? And I, my test for myself is, like, if I can't explain what one of my investments does to my mum, what, what does this company do? I really shouldn't own the damn thing. Because sometimes you have to be able to, my mum is a smart lady. I'm not saying, like, I'm trying to explain it to a dummy. I'm just saying, I have to understand it so well and so cleanly that can I, I could explain it to, like, a five-year-old in, like, five minutes. And then I understand it sufficiently well that I should be invested in it. This is so important. And I think many people really mess up when they skip this step. Because if you think about what you're doing when you're starting is you're becoming an owner, literally. It's, it's to me, somewhat embarrassing to, embarrassing might be too strong a word, but if I'm, if I'm all of a sudden an, an owner of something and somebody asks me, what do you own? And I'm like, oh, I, I, I don't know. Like, like it's, I can't, it's, it doesn't really make sense because that immediately tells me you're gambling or you're just listening to other people's ideas and you have no idea. So you should not own that business. But the moment you, you look through a slide deck, often you'll be surprised by the depth of the company's offerings and, and how the products fit together and visions of the future. And after doing that, you still say, like, I would be proud. Maybe pride is also maybe too exaggerated, but certainly you don't want to feel ashamed of owning a company and you don't want to, you know, be puzzled by it. Yeah. And I, I think I'll, maybe it's optional, maybe it's mandatory, right? I think it's really good to be interested in the company and what it does and how it's getting on. Because if you can get interested in it, it doesn't, it's not work then, like, because you are going to want to manage your portfolio. Like if you're not interested in tracking the journey of the company, let's say Apple, like, you know, studying its new products and are they landing well with consumers and are they still in a good place? If that doesn't interest you, you probably shouldn't be invested in that company, right? You should probably be the guy or girl who sticks to investing in indexes. But if you can find like the joy in that, which it sounds like bit dumb but like I genuinely really enjoy going much deeper than we just described and really getting in my arms like buried in the numbers if you can find the joy and the interest in that then it becomes kind of fun it becomes a hobby and that's how you suddenly look back like 20 years later you've got your own investing podcast and you're like uh, you know waxing lyrical about some of these random companies to your own three patreons <laughs> that's right <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And by the way, by the way, this is important for beginners to know. Uh, I think there's a kind of um, barrier to entry, which is often financial statements. And I think what many people think if they go to investor relations is that all of a sudden they'll be hit with a bunch of 10K forms and AQ filings and SEC. And, and that does require 
a kind of nerd level, uh, that's when you're really getting in the weeds. But that is really not necessary to be an outstanding investor. Right. We're talking about, what I'm talking about is there's a natural joy to learning. It's hu all humans as children enjoy learning because it's interesting. So even if it's on the surface of boring business, say, like, let me actually give you a real example. Like I think of Chipotle as like, how, how much joy could I get learning about a burrito uh, grill, you know, franchise shop, but lo and behold, <laughs> right? Because I am interested in this company and was a former shareholder owner. I now know that they're trying to use AI robots to build the burrito bowls, you know, themselves. I'm like, wow, that's, is, that's where the world is going. So as a share owner, as an owner, I would definitely dive into that and think of all the landscapes of, of knowledge that open up just via something as boring as a restaurant business. Yeah. And, you know, you put like a sort of techie spin on that and that it, technology and innovation and that stuff does interest you and I. But even if it was, say, a retail company, like a luxury goods company, you know, maybe the next Hermes handbag, right? You're Maybe you're excited about fashion and trends and things like that. And that might be the domain you choose to invest in. And the joy you'll find from reading some of these presentation decks is understanding their product strategy and who their next like designers are for the next season, whatever it might be. In my venture capital portfolio, I've got a holding in a lingerie company, and I can tell you their uh, quarterly reports are a good read. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling that that acknowledgement might just have gotten you some future Badger Patreons. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to take that playbook and <laughs> start talking about spicy things. I have another thought about the, the beginning, the very beginning stages, because that's what we're literally talking about, right? I would also recommend starting with, uh, this is a generalization, but what I would say big companies that you don't expect to make you a huge fortune, but that sort of like the idea of tracking the S SPY as a unit, if I buy one share of something like Amazon, I am very confident because it's a close to a trillion dollar business that this company won't suffer the fate of many other businesses, which is go out of business, go bankrupt. And that that beginning chunk will provide, I guess, stability, something like an anchor. So maybe that's an interesting metaphor, like start your portfolio with a bunch of anchors, yeah. companies that are solid, that you won't like make you dizzy and nauseous, then evolve from there. And as the numbers get a little bit bigger, maybe you'd have like a different weighting you know you might have like a, a big chunk which might be say in the let's say in the ten thousand dollar portfolio like a big chunk might be a thousand bucks and a small chunk might be like 200 bucks so maybe you buy like eight big stocks and then you you can still buy like 10 like 200 dollar chunks of some little fun interesting stuff and if one of them blows up it's not going to do too much damage and maybe you learn some interesting lessons but that's something that's maybe a bit later, as Christoph says, when you're really starting out trying to keep this super simple, it's just so you don't scare yourself away from the um, the whole endeavor, because this is a lifetime endeavor if you really get into this stuff. Start out small, keep it simple, keep it low risk, and learn your lessons. But above all else, do get started. I do want to share one other quick important thing, and it may not seem important at the beginning, but like, trust me, after once you have like 20 years in the game, it's incredibly important. And it's to make sure, even from the very start, if you can, you're making use of tax efficient accounts. So in the UK, there's something called an ISA. In the US, there's something called a Roth IRA, if I got that right. And like most governments will allow you to invest a certain amount of money a year. I think in the US worth like 5,000 bucks, 7,000. 7,000. In the UK, it's 20,000 pounds. And you can invest that money. And any returns you make are mostly tax-free. There might be some nuances depending on your jurisdiction, but mostly tax-free. And yeah, like it doesn't matter when you've got like a $10,000 portfolio because your gains might be 
I don't know, like a thousand bucks a year or something. But if you stay at the table and you keep investing for like 20 years, like that's probably faster than you think that's going to turn into a six figure, maybe a seven figure, maybe more portfolio. And when you get to those kind of numbers, like you'll be thanking yourself that you, uh, that all of your returns at that stage are tax free because that's suddenly really, really material. Definitely agree. This was one of the biggest mistakes that I made. I didn't learn about this stuff till later. Uh, taxes are like kryptonite to me. There's something like my monkey self loathes about the Byzantine, I mean, especially in the US. So yeah. I, I, I was way too ignorant for too long. But yes, if you're a US investor, first thing you do, you set up an IRA Roth, uh, that's $7,000 max. But then it also, because you, there's a penalty to withdrawing earlier, it sets you up in the correct mindset. You're literally saying to yourself that you're not going to touch that money for a long time. And whether then the market goes up or down and goes crazy, it really doesn't affect you that much. So it puts you in the right mindset and then there's all the tax benefits. So absolutely. One thing I want to go back to uh, previous, uh, what we were talking about previously, when I was saying like start with bigger companies that are like anchors, go to a website, companiesmarketcap.com. There's a bunch of sites like this that list all the companies in the world in terms of largest to smallest, mm -hmm. because you'll be forgetting some. That would be your first homework assignment, right? And then go down that list and ask yourself, which of these companies are you actually interested in? And so you'll see like uh, oil company. No, not for me. Oh, Tesla. I like that one. You know, oh, Disney, not for me. Oh, this pharmaceutical one. I like that one. And then, you know, start with a list like that from which you could winnow down. Great shout. Top of the list, you'll be unsurprised to hear is Apple. Uh, it's like, what, almost tr $3 trillion, right? Yeah, $3.47 trillion with Microsoft snapping at its heels at $3.2 trillion. This is like, these are, these are the, this is now the time of trillion dollar companies. And it won't be so long before we've got $10 trillion companies. Yeah, interesting times. Yeah, I'm shaking my head because my younger self had many, many, many Apple shares. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that's, an, you know what, I'll say it again. If I had taken my own advice that I'm telling you right now, which is have found a company that I loved because I used it, bought a little chunk and then done nothing, uh, it would be a whole different game for me. But that would mean just not to make it seem seem like, oh, uh, that's so easy. Apple was on the verge of bankruptcy, by the way. So it's not like, like in hindsight, obviously everything's obvious, right? But it happens more often than you would think. It's shocking how often this kind of thing happens. If you start with an anchor that you really know or care about or uh, have enthusiasm for, you buy something like, one tenth of your portfolio in that and then do nothing odds are staggeringly in your favor i do want to share like a, a bit of an anecdote a friend a close friend of my wife's has started investing a relatively small amount of money just to get started kind of following the model that we've been talking about for the last half an hour and then she messaged me maybe a month or two ago and said hey luke like i invested in this company like i looked at the investor deck and i, I bought some stock and my shares are up like 30 percent. should i sell and like maybe we're going now beyond the original question of like, how do I invest my thousand bucks? It's the wrong question to be asking yourself. You shouldn't be saying, oh, it's up X percent or it's down X percent. Should I sell? Should I buy? If you're tracking your stocks, you should be looking at the performance of the company. And if you still think that that's a good investment, like nothing, the wheels haven't fallen off in some way, let it run. Like let it, let it, uh, like that rolling stone gathering moss. And if you, you know, if you trim or you sell your winning positions when they're just getting started, you never have the chance to make like the very, very significant gains that can come over an investing lifetime. I've got multiple stocks that have returned 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, 250 times in one case. Like you can't get a 25,000% return if you sell when you're at 30%. Right. And we're talking about here the absolute principle fundamentals. Yeah. So my greatest mistake is being too smart for my own good, so to speak, right? It's kind of amazing that the simplest things are not necessarily easy to 
to do, even though they're sort of simple. But the principle here is the main thing. If you're thinking like an investor, you are thinking like an owner. And if you're thinking like an owner, say, if you own your house, do you think you, how, how often do you say to yourself, oh, my house is now worth 7% more than it was yesterday. Let me put it on the market, right? You don't do that because like that's obscene, <laughs> grotesque, absurd, right? But so if you take this mindset of really investing in a business, then it won't matter, as Badger was saying, whether it's up 30%, even though technically it might be quote unquote overvalued and due for correction. But that's for later. Right now, you're, you're, you're building anchors. Great. Well, Suzanne, we took what was a simple question and turned it into like half an hour of argument. So I hope you managed to pass something useful out of that conversation. I'd like to know from Suzanne if she gets back to us whether the uh, squabble we just had about buying a you know <laughs> one unit uh, share of something like SPY index tracker, whether that confused her or whether that's uh, something that she's going to do. So Susan, let us know. <laughs> it would be good to hear from you on the Twitters. Let us know uh, if you got started and, and tell us which stocks you bought. Be fascinated to hear what tickled your fancy. Well, shall we talk about our brand new segment in the show, Christoph, which I suppose are two stocks that have kind of tickled our fancies a little bit, stuff on our radar. Let me just quickly share why I'd like to do this as a regular spot on the podcast, because I think my radar has broken. I've probably got like 30 stocks in my overall portfolio, but the majority of my own investments are in more like a top 12, top 13. And I don't really have a sort of good working source of new ideas right now. I've kind of turned inwards a little bit. So I'd like to start looking out there, scanning the horizon, and then finding a way to encourage myself to look for interesting new opportunities. And so I think if we have this as a regular spot on the podcast, it's going to force me to rock up every week and just give you a fairly ill thought out one minute elevator pitch on a company. So we're going to do that for this week's episode. And if you guys like the format, we might make it a regular thing. And what we'd like to ask you at the end of the episode is give us a tweet or a comment on the YouTube or on Spotify and respond to our poll and let us know which of these two ideas you thought was the most interesting. Right. And maybe even more importantly is we need to figure out what we were going to call this segment. So uh, I was fishing for something like Indiana Jones, like, you know, he's an archaeologist looking for the Holy Grail in the temple. But that's a long ass name segment. So if you have something snappier for us, what to call this search for, you know, the next idea, let us know. And I, I like the I like the poll, too. I like uh, our audience members telling us which of these two very informal first pitches are more interesting to them. And then depending on, you know, what, what the, what the crowd says, that'll give us uh, more direction, which of the companies we, we should investigate maybe more thoroughly with greater vigor. So who are we talking about today? So let me have a crack at my first stock pitch for this new segment. I would like to pitch the idea of a company called Oaklo ticker O-K-L-O. So Oaklo are super early stage, pre-revenue company pioneering next generation nuclear power plants. And if you've listened to me ramble on this podcast in the past, you'll know that I used to actually own a company called SMR, New Scale Power, who own small modular reactors. Oaklo is not wildly dissimilar. And my thesis for Oaklo isn't wildly dissimilar either. Essentially, the world needs much more clean power. Nuclear power is clean and modern reactor designs are incredibly safe. Literally more people die putting solar panels on roofs than have ever died uh, involving in like a nuclear accident of any sort. Oaklows have a design for something called the Aurora power plant, and that's mostly intended for off-grid applications and so like these things like remote communities military bases industrial sites but i think the application that makes the most sense to me and resonates with me is data centers because ai runs in massive data centers like the cloud 
is just someone else's computer. When you say, you look at your phone, something's happening in the cloud, it's happening in a massive data center somewhere in the world, probably an Amazon or a Google or a Microsoft data center that's probably only like a couple of hundred miles physically from where you're based, because uh, they're all over the world. And these data centers use incredible amounts of power. And as AI becomes more and more important to society, like AI currently, although it's becoming more efficient, like these large language models take a shit ton of power to power them. So that's kind of the thesis for companies like NVIDIA, but and the people who are building the data centers and building the hardware, but they need the power to run it on. And so Oaklo is a really interesting idea, I think. And one reason I particularly like this idea, and I'm bringing it from my, my first pitch on our new segment, is the chairman of Oakla is none other than Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, the uh, chat GPT guys. And I think the fact that Sam is also sitting on the board of Oakla is really going to be a catalyst if they do get to commercial scale, which is a long way away. And like certainly OpenAI are going to be one of the key uh, customers of companies like this. Okay, I guess th there won't be follow up questions, right? We're just kind of uh, pitching. Sure. Yeah. Chat, about, chat about it if you like. Like you can you can push back on it. I can't I can't defend the thesis. I think it's an interesting idea. And I shall tell you, what, I will say I think it's actually a bad investment. So this is on my radar, but I don't think this is a good investment today because the company is like zero revenue. There's more money in Suzanne's portfolio with a thousand bucks than there is revenue being made by Oaklo, I think. Um, and they're on a like a decent burn rate. They're spending something like 40 or $50 million a year, and they've only got about 200 and something million dollars in the bank. So they're going to have to raise a load more money. They don't anticipate getting to revenue, even if they ever do, before 2027. And being realistic, that's probably more like 2030. So yeah, this is probably a poor investment right now. But I think this is worth keeping on your radar. Hence, I'm pitching it as a stock to watch. Well, first one comment, one question. How about we do it that way? Okay. My my comment is I like this area that you're looking. This is why I have in King of uh, the Jungle portfolio, my company Iron, Iris Energy, because they're a Bitcoin miner, but they're involved in building out the data power structure for AI, basically, and they're on the cusp of signing some big customers. So I think we're thinking the same way in that regard. But my question was going to be, like, are we going back to the future? Uh, to what extent, you know, like, are we talking about two years, three years, 10 years? And the biggest trap I know about ideas that sound fascinating like this is that the reality uh, is still way further than you think. And my own mistake frequently is being way, I like being early, but I'm often super, super, super early. And as an investor, that's often not, not uh, ideal. Yeah, and this is definitely the case with Oaklo today. Uh, you would be, an investor today would be super, super early. The current market cap is about a billion dollars. And like I said, the company has zero revenue and it probably doesn't anticipate having any really material revenue until, let's say, generously at least 2027, 20, 28. I think I would, as an investor, I'll be waiting for the revenue tap to turn on and to see them getting beyond like agreements in principle with potential clients to actually being, let's say, at least within a year, like they've broken ground, they've started building these reactors, they've got their approval, and they've got real customers who are on the hook and have signed real contracts to buy power. That's the, probably the time when this might come off the radar and into the portfolio. Yeah, so what I might do, speaking of organizing ideas and like getting your ducks cracking in a row, I might start a new portfolio, like abstract portfolio, and add a share of Oaklo, uh, theoretically, right at today's price, just to keep just to keep tabs on it. You think one share bullshit? I, I might stick <laughs> it on my watch list. <laughs> <laughs> I like owning one share. It keeps it keeps me uh, keeps me more interested. All right, are you ready for my for my first discovery? So let me do a screen share. So as a reminder, th these are very, very crude notes. This is not sophisticated by any stretch of the imagination, but I am interested in the company uh, Sphere, 
uh, ticker symbol SPHR. The short version is that this is a company that has two segments. One is a boring old segment, MGM Networks, which runs the entertainment for the New York City area. So think uh, Yankees and Rangers and Madison Square Garden and some shows. But that's a steady business. But these folks went out and created what I think is the world's most sophisticated entertainment venue ever made uh, called The Sphere in Las Vegas. And what's fascinating to me about this as a business is that the sphere in Las, the sphere, this venue, this giant dome on which you have, I think, the most high tech sound and visual technologies and all kinds of like haptic, your seats shake and it's kind of this immersive venue is located in the world's entertainment capital of Las Vegas. So the thesis here is that. Up front, this thing cost massive amounts of money to build, I think to the tune of $2.3 billion. And there's a lot of early investors that are sitting on huge losses. But a year into operations, we're now seeing the kinds of events that can be hosted here for premium, premium dollars. So there was just a Ultimate Fighting Championship event held there. A live draft was held there. Formula One event is going to be held there. You could rent it out via like corporate suites and kind of have the world's best party there. And it seems to me the future of entertainment. At the moment, that's not really like, I think that's kind of a wash because IMAX, I remember investing in IMAX being, you know, like um, really blown away by the theatrical experience. And depending on where you entered that stock, you, you, you're either up a little bit or down a little bit. It hasn't like exploded. I think what's happening here is that there's a assumption being made by Wall Street that each show is created equal and that the margins are much lower than they will be in the future. This business really will be about maximizing butts and seats. And are the shows that are being offered is most of the money going to the artist or is Sphere keeping most of it? So if you think about it, Badger, in terms of like upfront costs, it costs this massive amount of money to build, not only build the structure, but they also have a secondary studio in California where they, you know, shoot and develop the films. But once they have a film in hand that is their own, they're going to keep the majority of that money. And the margin of the costs will essentially be running the show itself. So things like hiring ushers and concession stands, which is very, you know, that's minimum expenditure. So right now, investors are looking at this, wondering if the operations make sense. And so far, the numbers have not been great. It's still burning a lot of cash because of all the upfront costs. But as a potential investor looking at this, I could count on one hand how many events I would legitimately make a kind of destination make it like a point to go see. And this is this is an off-the-cuff proposal to you. When you're back in the U.S. next time, I think you and I should absolutely 100% try to make it out to go see the new U2 film that was recorded specifically for The Sphere. And when I, when I just say that, I get excited about that idea, right? That's why I think this is like a, 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 you know, a diamond in, in, in the mind kind of thing right right structure in the right place with infinite demand given how many people 40 million annual visitors to vegas so you're always seeing new eyeballs going in and out and when you have like marquee names live performances potentially lady gaga might be like in the residency that's a rumor being tossed around the eagles were just playing there's this fascinating new what's called electronic dance music performer that will be playing six shows at the end of the year for mega, mega bucks. I think the margins will make this a home run. Yeah, I like it. I'm really glad when I saw this one in our Monday dashboard that it was your first stock because this is one that was genuinely on my radar like a year ago and I forgot about it. So a, a comment and a question then. So I, I recall seeing that they do have international rollout plans and London kicked them back. They were supposed to be building a sphere 
in London, in Stratford, which was kind of like the Olympic Park from London 2012. And our mayor, unfortunately, I'm a big fan of his, Sadiq Khan, but uh, he's kicked it back because of, like you saw in Christoph's screen share, the big eyeball on the outside. Essentially, like the residents of Stratford don't want this giant eyeball or smiley face or whatever, like video showing on the outside of the thing, polluting their light and ruining their environment because it's kind of a residential neighborhood too. So this kind of thing super works in Vegas. Do you think it could work? at scale in like the Singapore's and the Dubai's and the other capitals like that. Yeah, that's exactly, I think you're, that's the point, right? There's this untapped, the, the second half of the thesis is international expansion. Hmm. In my sense is that this, this is a big world. And if you have things like say Burning Man existing, you know, Burning Man is a festival in the middle of the desert, but the people that go there are fanatical about it because it's life changing. So the fact that it would be that some of these alternate expansions would be located in places like Dubai, say, which are destination, uh, uh, destination, I don't know what the right phrase is, like uh, deliberate destination venues, whatever. So no, this kind of thing won't be like IMAX popping up in, say, every city because of what you said. But the, But I don't think you'll need them to pop up it's kind of, I'm thinking of this more like Disney World or Disneyland, right? There's the original, then the second one popped up. You know, there's Florida and California, then there's now one in China. So if you have like slowly expand into, say, 10 places in the world, there are 10 places on this planet that are, you know, not part of the NIMBY crowd, not in my backyard. So um, it's just a matter at this point, I think, uh, about execution and whether they could prove that the margins are in fact so superior that you just have to get through the initial costs to make it a worthwhile investment. And I think that's what we're starting to see. And I really, really want to test drive this. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm super keen. Yep. All right. That's a, that's a great entry for the watch list, whatever the hell we're calling this segment. So I guess our our ask to listeners is go find one of our many polls. We'll stick them on Spotify and X and a few other spots and go give us a, a vote. And what you're voting for is, I think, the most interesting of those two ideas. Because even my one, it's, I don't think it's investable. Oklahoma is not investable today. I'm not asking that question. We're saying, like, does this thing, is it interesting enough for you to put on your watch list? Exactly. Yep. All right. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, we are on YouTube and all major podcast platforms. Subscribe now for a finance podcast that's hopefully as fun and playful as it is insightful. And as you should know by now, we are on patreon.com slash wallstreetwildlife. Please let us know by throwing us a, a, a little bit of coin if you want to be part of our intimate inner circle to support our efforts to make the show even better. But we do love all our listeners. And if you can't spare us a little bit of cash to help us pay for the editing costs and, and all those sort of bits and pieces that I currently do, my sweat and labor, then just give us a like or a subscribe, give us a comment. Those things always help. A five-star review on Apple Podcasts goes a long way to helping us get traction and grow the show. You can also find us on Twitter. That's the best place to chat to us if you've got questions or you want to pose a quandary like Suzanne's and maybe it will turn into another whole podcast episode and argument. I, on the X's, I am at 7 Luke Hallard. Um, at seven flying platypus. Also, we have a website, wallstreetwildlife.com, where you could find our 10 laws of the investing jungle, which are geared for all beginner investors and medium and advanced investors too, who have yet to internalize them. <laughs> are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. <laughs> A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.